and welcome to CRT in the Classroom, an intro to the R tool. The R tool is the Affirming Racial Equity Tool, a product of the Department of Diversity, Equity, and Poverty. We will be walking you through it today along with touching on how to integrate this tool into PLCs and how all of this work relates to culturally responsive teaching. My name is Rachel Klein and I serve um, middle schools as an equity and inclusion resource teacher. You have my contact information there on the screen and if you are interested in reaching out to me and would prefer a phone call, you can email me and I'd be happy to share my number with you. And I am Avon Cook. I service our high schools. You have my contact information there. And as Rachel said, if you need assistance, you need support, you need guidance, please feel free to reach out. All right. So as we get into our to-do list for today's session, we are going to be talking about the different levels of culture that we can understand and see in our classroom, as well as some introductory elements of culturally responsive teaching that will help us better articulate the purpose of CRT when we align it with the R tool. We're also going to talk about how the R tool interacts with the existing JSPS framework. And we are also going to talk about how you can utilize the R tool to plan with equity in mind. And Avon, thank you for that. I want to call note or attention rather to the hashtags at the bottom. Um, you have our Twitter handles now and we can share a few more later as they relate to um, DEP. But if you are listening and learning and feel compelled to share your learning or as the year progresses, something strikes you and you want to call our attention to it, please use the hashtag. That's a very effective way for us to begin um, cultivating a collection of resources related to racial equity. So um, we want to begin with some basics. We want to look at what culturally responsive teaching actually is. And Gloria Ladson Billings tells us that culturally responsive teaching or CRT is a pedagogical shift that allows us to recognize just how important everybody's cultural references are when we are teaching and learning alongside kids. So pulling on their culture, pulling on their experiences, pulling on their perspectives. We will get more into CRT in a bit, but we believe that it's much more important to begin with what culture actually means. So to continue with researchers who do work around um, culturally responsive teaching practices, as well as brain science, um, we wanna to turn to what Zaretta Hammond has to say. She's the author of CRT and the Brain, and she describes three levels of culture, surface culture, shallow culture, and deep. So you'll notice that there's a link there, and when you have access to this presentation, you can access this page on your own, but this is the part of the page I'd like for you to go to once you are looking at this. So let's first make sure we understand what surface culture is. And it's very much what it sounds like. It's that which we can see and observe on the surface. These are going to be very visible things. It might be what a student is bringing in his or her lunch bag. It might be their dietary choices as it relates to perhaps religion. It might be the way that a student clothes themselves or um, the music that they listen to and the holidays that they might be absent for. Um, so. These are things that we can we can perceive almost immediately, and quite often there's not a lot of emotional connection to that. It doesn't necessarily interfere with um, surface interactions. We get a little deeper into shallow culture, and some of these things are those implicit or or hidden or unspoken rules around the way that kids are taught at home to interact socially. Um, it might have to do with our social norms, um, gestures, our, our eyes, where we place them when we speak to somebody, a, a handshake or not, um, how the passage of time is conceptualized, how a personal space is protected, nonverbal communication. There's so much here. Um, and attending to these, understanding these um allows us to begin building our classroom cultures but when we're not aware of some of these shallow culture cultural elements then there can be an emotional charge behind this it has a lot to do with how 
it's eye of the beholder. It has a lot to do with interpretation and assumptions. Finally, we want to look at deep culture. And so much of this has to do with unconscious assumptions and biases that impact our uh, worldview. And um, it, it builds on service and shallow culture, but it goes far deeper into what drives us ethically, um, our spiritual beliefs, how we maintain our own health, um, how we believe we should interact as communities. Um, it might have everything to do with the ways in which we learn or um, take in new information. So these are deep things. So of course you would imagine that there's going to be some intense emotional responses. Um, near the end, there's a huge thing that's worth noting on this page. Um, our brains are, are trained to understand things or perceive things and then navigate from there. So you might see that fight or flight response and that is a student's brain directly responding based on their cultural perspective. So knowing that we have those three levels of culture and we just reviewed them, um, I wanted to make sure that you see that there's a, a summary of all of these here on this screen. So just a quick review, surface is observable, um, easy things to perceive, shallow, there's gonna be some unspoken rules around the ways in which we interact, and deep, um, that digs far into um, the subconscious and it has a lot to do with our world. So something worth noting, <laughs> when we were talking about, uh-oh. Got it. When we are talking about the different levels of culture, as Rachel said, surface culture is easily observable and there's not a whole lot of emotional charge to it. Understand that in a classroom setting, that goes both ways. So in the same way we can observe and understand a student's surface culture, they're also understanding and viewing our surface culture as educators. And if you look at that resource document that we linked, in shallow culture, which is kind of the middle ground, it's made clear that interpretation of certain behaviors as disrespectful, offensive, or hostile can easily occur. So when we're talking about classroom norms, classroom culture, how we are purposely constructing space for student relationships to develop, and or how we as teachers are engaging with our students, even wading slightly into shallow culture can elicit emotional responses from students, again, because their brains are hardwired to understand and to view the world in a certain way. And this plays out as we are navigating these different levels of culture. Thank you. And that is hugely important to consider as we enter these uncharted waters regarding um, digital community building. There's, this is so much, I won't say it's even more important, but it's more critical for us to be aware of those spaces that we're creating and the ways in which we're asking our students to interact with us. So very good point there. So we wanna walk you through an exercise here. Even I'll turn it over to you. So what you have here in this graphic are some of the different things that make up a person's whole identity. This is not an exhaustive list, but when we think about the ways in which we describe ourselves, typically the average person will pull a handful of items from this kind of curated wheel. Um, so when we are talking about how we position ourselves and how we understand our culture, that is going to require a certain level of your own understanding and a little bit of self-reflection about what you value, what your culture has taught you to value, and how those values come out in the classroom space. So what we'd like you to do is looking at this wheel, um, Choose one identity that you want to focus on. So it may be your um, gender, maybe your ethnicity, it may be your nationality, uh, it could be your race, it could even be your religion. But within the context of you as a educator in the classroom working with children, think about one of these examples and we're going to walk you through a quick exercise. Next screen for the next portion or are we still, we want people to simply identify their um, chosen identity. How about we identify ours and then we'll move them forward? Perfect. All right. For sake of example and to model for you all, um, 
I will, I will select age. For the purposes of this, I think I'm going to select race just because of everything going on in Louisville. I think it has to sure. become a conversation. Okay. So fair. let's go. All right. In fact, I'm going to leave that on there just a moment now that Ava and I have spoken. Pick one from here. You have 10 seconds. Have it in your mind. Be ready. All right. Let's go. All right, Avon, what's next? So what we want you to do is think through these two kind of questions, and it's going to be a thinking process. You can pause this as you need. Um, so think back to those ideas of surface, shallow, and deep culture, and try to apply it to your cultural identity. Um, and then once you've done that, we want you to take the time to reflect on what elements of your culture through that lens, particularly from deep culture, have possibly clashed with a student's deep culture. Because especially in JCPS, we know that our kids are wildly diverse. We have upwards of 123 languages spoken daily. We have students of all nationalities, all orientations, all religions represented. So in thinking through this, Rachel, how do you interpret age in shallow culture? Age is visible. Um, obviously, based on the way that I dress, I might dress more youthfully than my um, than a colleague who's been at it for a number of years or not. Um, the the willingness I might have to walk around my classroom and bend down and get up and move and demonstrate through my energy levels, it, it might be something that kids can perceive. And to my benefit, in my first several years of teaching. Middle schoolers were not ready to see me zipping around the classroom as fast as they were. Mm -hmm. And so in some senses, that created a quick community because they recognized that I was the one that was going to flit about and, and work with them at their energy levels. And they were not prepared for that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the obvious visible age, but then what I'm willing to demonstrate with physically with my body. Do you want me to keep moving and then we can do yours? Sure. So okay. I think I misspoke. I think I said, how would you see that in shallow culture? But obviously that was surface level. So if you think about age through shallow culture, what would sure. become more prominent or what would become more important to you? Um, I, I think things would change for the, for the shallow part because there's going to be inside jokes based on your eight, your generation. Mm -hmm. Um, Growing up through the internet age, I often say that I am a, I'm comfortable in a digital analog hybrid space where I learned in a very analog fashion. And then as I got older and progressed through school, I computers and internet became far more integrated into my learning. And so there are times when I prefer learning, you know, paper, pencil, face to face. And there are other times when I'm perfectly content in the digital space. And for a lot of my students, they may they may think that I don't have all of the tech skills that they have. Mm -hmm. And in a lot of ways, I may have even more tech skills that they don't have. And so there might be some clash there. It might not be hugely emotionally charged, but a lot of assumptions start to bubble up Definitely. from that. Yeah. And, um, and I'm sure you would agree because you are a younger teacher as well. Um, the deep part, I think, gets into... Assuming that an older teacher doesn't know know as much about youth mm -hmm. and there might be some resistance to starting a relationship with a teacher and and letting them in and allowing them to meet a child where they are because they assume old people don't know anything or, you know, that was from a generation ago. What are you talking about, Grandpa? And so these assumptions quickly become a stereotype and quickly bias mm -hmm. and then without unpacking that and navigating that there is huge possibility for clashing um and then if you continue to explore the intersections of both age and sex and gender and religion and language the the gap grows wider and wider if you're not willing to to bring those intersections together and unpack that and talk about it. definitely i love the um your shallow culture makes me think about the fact that I'm of an age where I had a rotary dial phone in the house, in like my childhood home, but I now have a supercomputer that fits in my pocket. 
And when we talk about how we're navigating spaces with our kids, there are so many teachers who are more knowledgeable than me because they've had to adapt and they've had to find all these tips and tricks and things. Whereas I'm like, give me five minutes with it. I'll, I'll try and sort it out and I'll probably be kind of proficient at it. So Mm -hmm. with something as simple as age, we are already starting to unpack how these things can overlap, how these things can create bias, how they can create stereotypes. And if we're not cognizant of them, how quickly can they impact a child's education or the way that we run our classroom? Absolutely. Um, it, you know, we've, we've made Google a verb and it, it's, it, that in and of itself is an adaptation that the younger generation of students may not recognize about even our generation. Mm-hmm. Um, or meme culture. I can't tell you how many times kids will be like, you, you've seen that SpongeBob meme? <laughs> yes, I have. SpongeBob actually was on when I was a child. Thank you. And and so it, it's so quick to jump to that little sassy interaction. Yes, I grew up on SpongeBob. And, and so, but it, the way you might word that, the kids might go, whoa, oh my gosh, she's not as ancient as, as I thought. Oh, because their, so, their default is that we are both. all impossibly old. <laughs> but it does break down those barriers when we're simply willing to be ourselves mm. and to expose who we are to the children sitting in our classroom. Which hopefully is, not sitting the whole time. Hopefully. But that's really what this work gets into. It's a matter of seeing and being seen. And there's a lot of vulnerability in that, which is one Huge. of the reasons that we're modeling this. I think vulnerability needs to become a superpower versus something that's negative. Yes. Um, I speak to that frequently because we do talk about bias in our trainings and we do talk about racism. We do talk about how these things manifest if they go unchecked and to be vulnerable is to admit that you don't know everything or that you were wrong. And when our kids see that vulnerability, they then learn that they too can be vulnerable and we all can learn from mistakes and move forward. And fix. Definitely. So we've taken this a totally different direction. Would you like to talk about, um, did you talk about sexuality identity or race identity? It was race. Race. Okay, Um, let's go. So kind of similar to Rachel, I have never been given the, the credit of being white. I am biracial. My mother is white. My father is black. Um, but in the spaces I grew up in and had to navigate, I was never given the benefit of being white. Um, I've always been perceived, always been labeled as black. And because of my outward appearance, I'm always associated with the black community. Um, although I have been mistakenly identified as like Latina a couple of times or some mixture, um, therein, but for surface culture, for me with race, it's one of those things where I'm never going to be able to detract from being a person of color. Even if the person on the other end of that interaction can't properly identify my race, um, I, I don't have the privilege of being white passing or anything of that nature. So when you move that into shallow culture with everything that's going on right now, very, very quickly, you start looking at kind of social norms and cultural values around collective action and collectivism. And a lot of the protests that are happening here in Louisville are being led by these very strong community-focused, community-driven Black women. And that is very much part of my understanding of the Black community. When I think about my own family and I think about how we navigate things, my grandmother was the matriarch and still is a guiding hand in her children's lives even after her death. So when we talk about how we negotiate just everyday interactions and those expectations, a lot of that is caught up in her upbringing of my parents and how that has interacted with my cousins and how that's been passed down to me. Um, And I know in a classroom setting, a lot of times it can come off as something along the lines of respectability politics, where kids assume that I'm trying to sound white or act white, when really, in fact, I'm being perfectly original in that I am expected to be articulate. I'm expected to be intelligent. I'm expected to present myself in a respectable fashion, not just because of my father, but because of his mother and how she raised him so that he could survive in a very white, rural, Southern world. Um, So when we move that into deep culture, 
there's a whole array of things that kind of come out in the classroom for me. And a lot of it's protective because I was that kind of lone wolf growing up and I didn't have that protection. I didn't have that privilege. Um, a lot of my understanding of my role as an educator is to bridge things. So if you are not from a space where education is something that comes natural or is naturally supported or is naturally easy, I want to make it easy for you. I want to be that olive branch for you. Um, and a lot of times it's negotiating the academic versus the practical and talking about these kind of core beliefs. So for me, a lot of this got put on display with my kids. Um, and it got to the point where my kids knew that you can ask me anything and you're not going to offend me because ultimately I wanted to grow them and I wanted yeah. to see them do better than maybe they thought they could and definitely better than some of their, their other teachers had insinuated that they could be. Um, yeah. So it's definitely kind of a guiding insight that I have kind of constantly in the background. A lot of your words make it so clear that when we do take the time to expose who we are to our students, they can begin seeing themselves in parts of us. It doesn't have to be all of us, but when they can see that there's a connection to the student sitting next to them, to the teacher in front of them, then we really do get to unpack perspectives and we really do start to foster that empathy that is critical for learning about people who are nothing like us. And so we can learn from our person, the person next to us. If I wasn't learning from my students on a single day, then that was a day that I went home feeling like I didn't succeed yeah. because I never ever believed that I was the sole person in the classroom who contained all the knowledge. That's, that's not practical. That's not real. Um, and, I'm glad to hear you speak of that. And one more thing that you did mention in number two about that shallow or surface rather, race is extremely observable. And some people can 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 go to bed at night not having to, to consider what happened to them because of their race. Um, I'm married to a Jewish man and he is very white passing. He can hide the Hebrew on his arm if he wants to. He, he can lay his head down on the pillow at night, feeling like a white man if he wants to, and doesn't have to, he can he can hide the the religious implications that come with the, you know, judgment or stereotypes, but there's parts of him he can put away if he wants to. And that's so important to consider when we look into the faces of every one of our children. Well, and to that point, <laughs> thinking about the idea of hiding or masking or anything like that, um, we also have to realize that, especially for like our black boys and a lot of our black girls, um, there's data that proves it. They don't feel that sense of belonging. And you have to, as a teacher diving into this work, you have to take that step back and position yourself in a way that you are willing to be vulnerable and you're willing to navigate why that is. Why don't you feel a sense of belonging? And realize that many of these kids, black, brown, you know, have not been invited in. They have been wow. expected to leave huge parts of their identity at the door to simply be a student. So it's very important that we talk about these intersectionalities and it's very important that we are aware of how our children posit what is most important about their identities because just engaging in a normal conversation, you'll be able to find out what they care yeah. most about. Yes. And sometimes that requires you to simply ask. And if our instructional choices and strategies don't open up the floor to our ch children to tell us about themselves, then we're not allowing them to inform the, the path of, of instruction and to be able to research what they want to research. I mean, there, there's so much tied up in this. Um, but I do think this is a perfect lead in to um, now that we have taken a pretty deep dive into what culture actually is. Mm. Um, now we can start to look at some characteristics of CRT or culturally responsive teaching. Um, and there are seven major ones that we want to touch on today. Um, starting with number one, positive perspectives on parents and families. You may mention that, you know, you sit and you look out into your crowd of students and you see a crowd of, of diverse faces. You hone in on any one, for example, a black male, and immediately we turn to those 
those pre those conditioned stereotypes or beliefs that are built on assumptions and messaging and and bias and implicit communication. So we cannot ever begin a school year assuming that we know everything about every kid's parent or family. Mm. And to be open to letting them share a bit of who they are and what they expect of their child and what the child expects of themselves. Um, and keeping an open mind and letting our parents and families inform us on who they are and what they want from us as well. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add or if you'd like to move on to two. Well, just thinking about the, the assumption piece of it's very easy, especially in certain types of curriculum, to assume that everyone has a mom, a dad, a sibling, and this kind of almost idyllic life um, in home spaces. And I think most of us in JCPS shed that very quickly, but you still have these spaces that have been insulated from a lot of the realities some of our kids face where that idea still persists for some reason. Um, and it's just really important to realize that even if you don't have a kid of diverse background in your classroom, doesn't mean that they don't have family who has a very diverse or a very different background than what you're seeing them present to you. So it's just something to be extremely mindful of. Absolutely. Um, move on to number two. So communication of high expectations. I can only speak to um, what I did as a classroom teacher, which was not that long ago, of you can do this and you will do this. And for my kids, a lot of that came through with work that was at grade level. We talk about, you know, opportunity myth and achievement gaps. And we have data that shows how many kids nationwide, statewide, what have you, don't receive standards-based work at their appropriate grade level. Um, so my expectations were clearly communicated every day when they came in and they read the task on the board or they read our um, learning target and they were just like, oh, cook, can we have an easy day? And it's like, no, we're here to learn. You're here to grow. That's what we're going right. to do. So a lot of it was instruction based, but they were able to pick up very quickly of like, okay, I can't slack off in this classroom. <laughs> this is how it's going to be. Yes. And I, I think high expectations can be looked at in a different way as well. It, high expectations doesn't mean we lower our empathy quotient. No. We can certainly maintain high expectations while also understanding that we're dealing with very complex humans every single day. Mm. So there's so much to be said about that. Um, number three, I'm going to dig more deeply into in a bit, but learning within the context of culture, um, our kids deserve to feel contextualized within the learning classroom, within the content, within their own perspectives. We need to help them learn who they are. And that's not we, we can't do that by limiting them to canonical text, for example, or textbooks that are limited in their scope. Um, and CRT, it's perfect to note at this point with number three, culturally responsive practices benefit every, every learner yes. in the classroom. Yeah. Um, even though we are talking largely about the black and brown experience, when we allow our students of all races, creeds, backgrounds, you name it, to, to be exposed to diverse thinking, it it just continues to enhance the empathy and compassionate response and just to expand conscious. Um, and I, I, like I said, I'll get into three later. So let's move to four. Well, for me, four flows perfectly from three because when you think about how does that look, it's centered on the kid. It's centered on those students and it's validating their choices that they're making academically and it's validating their voices and their experiences. So when we talk about, you know, three for me, you can't you can't get away from the fact that it is student driven. Um, and for a lot of teachers, that's kind of a new idea, that positionality yeah. and handing off that um, that responsibility. And it's not so much handing off the responsibility as differently curating your lessons, but that in and of itself requires a certain level of vulnerability too. In the same way that we talked about vulnerability of opening up yourself, this kind of requires an opening up of your pedagogy and your practices. Yes. Yes. Um, I think three, four, and five all hold hands really nicely where if we're not allowing culture of our students to inform the direction of our, of our learning, of mm -hmm. our activities, of the discourse opportunities we're providing, if we're not 
pulling from diverse texts and perspectives, then our students will never feel seen or validated by content. They'll never feel seen or validated by the instructor and relationships will never form. And then we will never get anywhere. I mean, it's just an endless loop that serves almost nobody. Um, which leads into number six, where when we do pull on student voice and their advocacy and their ability to tell us what they want, how they want it, how they learn best, then the curriculum begins to take a totally different path. Um, my middle school colleague, Suzanne Kramer, who is the literacy lead for middle schools, she and I talked the other day about how curriculum shouldn't just reflect students, it should almost be the student. Yeah. When, yeah. when they are front and center in the classroom, then we know what to choose. We know how to, I mean, it's not, this change doesn't happen in a day. It, these are pedagogical shifts that are going to take time and intention, but all of them fit so neatly together. Well, and I think uh, with the idea of reshaping the curriculum, we have to be very cognizant of what we're giving our kids. And, you know, like you said, it's not going to happen in a day. You're not going to be able to go from your practices and your understanding of your pedagogy and completely shift it to being learner or student-centered overnight if that's not the background that you're coming from. But this can also start, even though it'll look different, it can start by thinking through your curriculum and what you all have agreed on as a PLC to teach and how it can be ingrained with your students' experiences. So a lot of this can also look like marrying together two halves of what should ultimately constantly be a single whole of the curriculum and students' experiences. Um, because you can't really have one without another when you're talking about student understanding of self in the classroom. Absolutely. And I think considering number seven, to pull all of that together, if we're just worksheeting our students to death, we're not facilitating knowledge and our kids will never climb out of depth of knowledge levels one or two, yep. arguably never out of one. Um, worksheets are compliance. Worksheets do not expand the mind. Worksheets do not expose to multiple points of view. Do we need opportunities to, to work through a skill set? Absolutely. But when we are truly orchestrating, you know, combinations of student experiences, student preferences, physical classroom setups and i know that in this very strange digital world we have to look at that differently but we are putting things we are putting things in motion we we are simply facilitating and we are we are providing feedback adequate and good feedback as necessary meeting kids where they are and setting them on their path um so you know there's a big shift coming our way but we also have to be intentional around it so I had made mention that with number three, and then it just kind of flowed beautifully into four, five, and six, <laughs> um, that we would get a little bit more into um, the way that we utilize culture as a, as a learning tool. So back to Zaretta Hammond, author of CRT and the Brain. Um, this first bullet point, when I read it, it has stuck with me so, so much. We, we all are equipped with the same hardware from from birth and then we immediately we begin receiving messages from our parents and family from our neighborhoods from the things we see our parents cook and wear and the church or temple or whatever services we might be attending from the language choices from the way that one person uses nonverbal communication it all becomes these these downloads from the world around us and so you know, we're all set up to receive it, but depending the culture we exist in, it becomes the software that's loaded in our brains. So if you consider what it's like to be an adult who for the first time in 30, 40, 50 years is being told you have implicit biases and we go, what? We have been receiving these messages for a very long time. And so it makes perfect sense to bristle against that because we're literally fighting that which has been downloaded into our brains for decades. And so it's no wonder that it's upsetting to be told that we might be causing damage to other people by way of our instruction, our curriculum, you name it. But when we really start looking at it from a brain science point of view, it removes the emotional component to a small degree and allows us to see our students as, as 
computers. You know, and it's it's unbelievable when you look at it from that point of view. Then we start going, oh my gosh. So their sense of belonging is largely based on how they've been made to feel included or not. And that comes by way of books and texts and examples and the way we arrange our students, the way we allow our students to speak to each other. And so you're also going to see the brain reacting with a fight or flight response. It, if you physically perceive and your brain receives those messages that you are not welcome, it will, it will shoot out those chemicals that say fight or flight. And so we often go, oh, that's a behavior issue. This is a discipline issue. No, they're fighting their brains. And sometimes the letdown from that, that fight or flight response at adrenaline rush can take upwards of half hour or longer for our kids. And so when we see a kid and we perceive them as having shut down and we write a referral because refusal to come, refusal to respond, refusal to talk today, refusal to comply, we're fighting their brains. We're not fighting the kid. We are fighting something that has been deeply installed for a long time. So even any comments or, or stretching on any of that? I just, I find it so interesting that the the software part right mm -hmm. a lot of times we assume that we don't have that and that comes back to implicit bias i couldn't possibly have implicit bias when no i do and i'm aware of what that those are and how they play out and that is how i control that fight or flight when a student says miss cook i that hurt my feelings i don't like that i don't like how this happened can we address this as a class so all of those moments that would normally like shoot adrenaline into a, a teacher's brain of like, oh God, this is going to go horribly wrong. Really, it comes back to those same kind of principles of we all have the same hardware, but the software is completely different. And even kids who on the surface might seem to have a lot in common can still have very different cultural understandings of self, of you, of school, of the whole system. You said something that is so fascinating when when we are as a teacher responding to a perceived behavior issue, it's literally a culture clash. The software is clashing. So it is a culture clash. And when you put it that way, it it makes it makes even more and more sense. Um, and I I learned that something recently that has also stuck with me. If we are to begin climbing out of this software and to at least recognize it for what it is. We need to be something, we need to be the fish that sees the water. In other words, a fish has no idea they're swimming around in water. That's all they know. I mean, that's their existence. That's the air they breathe. But when the fish becomes aware of his or her surroundings and can see the forest for the trees, then we really begin to understand and unpack our interactions with each other mm -hmm. and understand that it's coming from a very hard wired set of expectations that our pattern our pattern machine up here our brain is telling us to do so when we remove the emotion and we start to see it for the for the brain patterns and the hard wiring we all have then we can start to really move forward in a positive way agreed so this link here is going to take you to the images we see on the following screen um i'm not going to open it from here but um avon has broken down what this link is it's just it's literally a graphic and we've broken it into two slides um so even tell us what we are gonna what, what this ready for rigor framework is so when we're talking about whether or not our students are ready to do grade level rigorous work that is going to be affirming and challenging and follow best practices we have to be aware of a handful of things um the first two are right here. So first and foremost, awareness. Um, do we understand how the brain learns? Do we understand the cultural archetypes or biases um, that our students may be operating from? And have we, as the leaders in the classroom, broadened our own interpretations of what it means to be culturally diverse and inclusive? Um, and then also understanding that really at the start of the year, especially in a setting like NTI where we are digital, we are entering into a learning partnership. And for once we have 
the power to actively include caregivers in that relationship. So even though this specific graphic is speaking to the student teacher partnership that you typically have in a classroom, when we are in NTI and students are in their home environment, their caregivers are going to be infrequently on hand, but definitely more on hand than they would be during a normal school day. So when we talk about how we are caring for and how we are nurturing those relationships, are we giving balance? Are we prioritizing equally mental and emotional health as well as rigor and academic success? Are we making sure that our students understand the content well enough to take ownership of their learning so that we can have more student-centered approaches? Um, and then also making sure that your practice is visible enough that students can come to you and help identify and help talk through where they're struggling and where they need your support. Um, and that leads to the second two portions of the Ready for Rigor framework. And I think, um, Avon, you made a really good point about meeting our kids where they are and understanding what their needs are. And that directly relates to how they process information. Um, we have some kids, I mean, if we want to talk about neurodiversity, we have some kids who would much rather interact in the chat or kids who would like to process an image. Um, kids who would rather talk back and forth with each other, kids who want to talk with us one-on-one, -on -one, kids who need to draw what they're learning to be able to demonstrate that they get it. We have conceptual thinkers and we have concrete thinkers and we have kids who just need to be activated in a way that, that makes sense to them. Now, can we push their limits in a safe way where they begin to try something new? Absolutely. But we do need to understand what kind of learners they are. And this re relates back to that software um, where we are becoming aware as facilitators of learning the needs that our kids have so that we can allow them to process content in ways that work. Um, that second bullet point, a lot of cultural traditions are oral and they're learning stories and, and wisdom and parables through storytelling. Um, there's so much to maximize on there. And that can be brought into other content areas beyond language arts and social studies. And I challenge our science and our humanities and our, our math and our health and our every, all of our teachers to really start framing these concepts in a way that makes sense for their content. It is doable, it is possible, mm -hmm. and your resource teachers from DEP are here to help you make that real. Um, finally, looking at community of learners, um, I always believe that the community is built on trust and relationships and that doesn't happen just once it's not just at the beginning of the school year that's where it begins and then you go back and, and you fix something when it breaks and you talk about it when you need to talk about it and you break it down together and that's when you begin to pull on different voices and that's when you learn what people need and that's when kids learn to start trusting each other, relying on each other. And then your job as teacher really becomes facilitator. And that's when kids are directing their own learning and learning becomes meaningful and relevant when they are in charge. They will tell you what they want, but you need to make the space for them to say it. Um, before we move on, because even it is time to drop this R tool on our people. Um, we have gotten, we've waxed poetic, to, so yes. it's time to move. Do you have any other ideas before we go? No, but we will go uh, back to these ideas okay. at various points. You got it. All right. So we're going to wrap this up and move on into the R tool. Take it away. So ultimately, we, what we wanted you to get from this kind of foundation is an understanding that all of our brains have been hardwired in very specific ways. And these ways are directly correlated to the different identities that we take on, whether that's our age, our gender, our ethnicity, our race, our religion, our sexual orientation, and understand that our students don't come to us as empty vessels. They have a wealth of experience and knowledge and information that they, in the right spaces, can navigate to make academic gains. So when we are talking about um, the R tool, we want you to center this idea of CRT to think through how we can engage students through inquiry, through problem solving, and utilize best practice to really push on student achievement, even during an NTI setting. 
Perfect. So we want to give you a tool um, that we have developed as a team of resource teachers coming out of PLC or PLC out of EEP. So sorry. And um, we also know that the PLC framework is a very living document or set of expectations in JCPS. So um, Avon and I are going to walk you through the elements of the ARE or the R tool and show ways in which you can start building in these concepts into your planning process and then attach it to processes as you're already doing by way of the PLC framework. Um, so even if you don't mind transitioning into the next portion, did I leave anything out from this that you'd like to hit on? Um, not that I can think on, but if you move us forward one slide. So we understand, especially in um, some of our AIS buildings, that PLC is the lifeblood of what we do. Rachel and I are proof of that. She is middle, I'm high, but we're both secondary and we're finding those common grounds that we can navigate as professionals and as colleagues. Um, but rather than trying to give one more thing, because ultimately the R tool is racial equity. It's how you achieve racial equity in your classroom. So we really wanted to ground this in a practice that teachers are already using, which is the PLC framework. So as we go through the R tool, this is going to be very conversational of this is what this looks like. This is what this means. This is what this could be. Um, we're going to be referencing different steps of the PLC framework where that particular section of the R tool just kind of makes sense. But it's really important to note that this is not the only way of enacting the R tool. However, Rachel and I can both accept that the R tool is a very big lift if you are not familiar with this work. So what we are trying to do here is simply make it digestible so that it does become a tool in your toolbox that you turn to, to ensure that you are being racially equitable and that you're affirming for your students and their intersectional identities. Beautifully said. So um, we'll take you through each of the sections of the R tool. I am not going to read every indicator or item on each checklist. We don't have time for that today, but I will tell you that the R tool is linked in at least two places in our district. First, it is on the DEP webpage uh, list of resources, in addition to some other wonderful uh, resources that our team has curated and the department has curated. And then second, it's in the teacher backpack. Mm -hmm. So it's accessible in a lot of ways. It's even linked in this presentation. We want it to be something you begin to play it with. So the first section is content integration. At the top, you can see there that this is ultimately where teachers are pulling examples from a variety of cultures and groups so that students become um, exposed to diverse viewpoints, diverse cultures, diverse ways of thinking. We're pulling on materials and resources that contain a multitude of diverse identities and that they are either disrupting or not promoting stereotypes. We, we, it's not good enough to say, I've got a, a Latinx author. Well, great, but what is the content of the book that you are, are giving to your kids? We want to be as disruptive as possible in a positive way. And we're constantly looking for ways to um, validate the experiences of underrepresented people by way of curriculum, instruction, in school, and images, you name it. Um, and finally, we want our curriculum to allow students to both see into other people's worlds, we call that windows, and to see one's own experiences and contextualize that within their world and look inward, which is mirrors. All right. Knowledge construction, Avon. So when we talk about knowledge construction, a lot of that hinges on that software that we'd mentioned earlier and how we are negotiating the learning space and the learning partnerships that we are investing in in our classrooms. So as Rachel said previously, um, the diverse lenses that are being used? Are you utilizing windows and mirrors? In knowledge construction, that looks like providing students with the opportunity to not only identify, but critique power relationships. So talking about the privilege that is inherent in some of our curricular materials, talking about the oppression that oftentimes doesn't get the full understanding that it should in any given lesson. It also means that we are challenging our students in a way that allows them to do this inquiry work themselves. So positioning them contextually with 
in the discussion, within the curriculum, within the materials to think through the values, the assumptions, the word choices, the positioning of characters, of authors, of situations to be able to pinpoint who's telling a story and who's being left out of it. Um, but then also thinking through that in a science class in terms of how things are being applied and the historical understanding of a concept or an invention or anything of that nature. So ultimately, knowledge construction is really going to look at what are the cultural understandings and are they appropriate? And if not, in what ways can we push back or disrupt those cultural understandings? And something I do hear occasionally when I'll run a training is, well, what am I supposed to do? The science module is printed or this is what I have. I, I can't choose my curriculum in that respect. You can't choose that. Sometimes what you can choose to do is ask your students to, again, critique power relationships. Why is this whole chapter on energy and forces um, you know, they've called on so many white scientists, but then there's a little box on the last page of the chapter with the one black scientist that they want to feature or the one female physician who revolutionized whatever. We can look at power and balance by way of the textbooks that we do have and we don't always get to choose. Um, and one more thing and then we'll move on where it says word choices in that third from the bottom. Um, a principal in the middle schools recognized this in some of the math content that was being offered in his building where there was a question about how many driveways in a neighborhood does every neighborhood have kids? are we forgetting kids that live in an apartment complex um where there may not be driveways and tidy little yards and so word choices big and small can be extremely impactful and when we retrain our brains to start looking for even those tiny language shifts then our kids are on the, the winning end of things. Prejudice elimination. This weaves its way into all parts of the R tool, but this is where we are finding ways to constantly disrupt and build up understanding and to create that true empathetic response when we are exposed to life that is different from our own viewpoint, different from our own experience. So we're giving our kids the tools to say, oh my gosh, that author's biased. Oh my goodness, I can't believe that this math question has so many Eurocentric names. Um, and we are empowering our kids to see it. Um, that That is the bottom line when it comes to prejudice elimination. We can't do the work for them. We want to do the work with them, but we got to give them the tools to do it. Um, equitable pedagogy, Avon. So something that kind of links back to what Rachel mentioned, um, and this is something she mentioned earlier and then just brought back again. When we're talking about building a community of learners and a learning environment, it is not a one and done. It is not something that you are going to get to do at the beginning of the year and be done with. The same thing goes with prejudice elimination and equitable pedagogy. As you learn to master the R tool and as you get comfortable with some of the heavier languages, like heavier words um, and ideas, it is going to be a constant renegotiating of your practice and your pedagogy as you've known it to this point, um, which again is why we're here. We want to help you do this work. And what equitable pedagogy really looks at is how am I presenting what is expected of me and in what ways can I modify or better facilitate a student's learning so that it is affirming, so that it is equitable, and so that it's not upholding biases or stereotypes or very negative views of people of color or people who are just otherwise not considered part of the dominant culture. So a lot of equitable pedagogy is tied up in that development of a community of learners who are constantly engaging in this kind of inquiry based understanding and where you are using instructional methods that help maximize student achievement while also maximizing student understanding of self and of others. Uh, well said. The one thing I want to call attention to is that earlier you had mentioned high academic expectations, but be, be aware. I mean, it says high academic expectations, high rigor doesn't come without compassion, 
scaffolding and meeting your kids where they are. It's, it's doable, it's possible, and it's equitable. Um, looking at the next section, I recognize that's really tiny. Again, you have, an act, you have access to the tool itself. Um, an empowering classroom culture is one where teachers are uplifting and affirming racial identities, affirming culture. Um, the whole R tool, A-R-E, affirming racial equity. We, we also want to show that we do value the diverse contributions that are coming from a multitude of identities and intersections of identities and perspectives and experiences. That means we have got to give our parents and caretakers and our students spaces to speak that are safe and honoring the power of vulnerability. And so relationships are foundational. Conversation is foundational support and unwavering just, I am committed to you, student A. I promise you that I will do everything in my power to demonstrate that I want the best for you, mm -hmm. whatever that right. takes. And that looks different for every child, but it requires you to be the teacher that you signed up to be. And that is knowing your stuff and knowing your students and making the adequate shifts from there. Even anything you want to add to this one? Nope, you got it. Nailed it. So assessment pulls, pulls so many of these practices together. Um, I will put it in your hands and then if there's anything I need to add, I will. So assessment for me is one of the biggest pushes um, in terms of pedagogy and practice because we are brought through teacher preparation programs that kind of ingrain that assessment has to look a certain way, that assessments have to be um, time consuming, or that they have to be um, formatted in a specific way to be rigorous. So what the R tool, specifically R through assessments going to challenge you to do is think about um, using materials that are equally familiar um, to minority groups who are being assessed. So Rachel mentioned earlier, there being too many Eurocentric names in a math equation. When you expand on that idea and you take it full circle and you're looking at a unit, is it telling the full story or is it telling one person's understanding of that story? And the same thing can be said in, you know, science and math class when we're talking about these concepts, how are we positioning that relative to students' lives? The other big shifts in this piece is that assessments ultimately represent mastery. And that means that a student can grow. That means assessment is not something that's one and done. Students get to reassess as they need to showcase their mastery, to showcase that they have understood and they have achieved growth. So when we talk about what this looks like, um, especially in an NTI setting, we have a beautiful opportunity to co-create with other content areas to create something that is interdisciplinary in scope and that's going to provide students with a fuller understanding of a concept and the ability to see how these concepts interact and engage with each other. It's also worth noting that assessment should be built out in a way that supports CRT ideas. Um, so it's not something that can only be done in one way. Rachel mentioned earlier how important oral traditions are to people. And in fact, that's kind of a norm. Humans love storytelling. We are kind of wired for that. So in an NTI platform, instead of demanding that a student write a X number of pages or X number of words essay, could you not instead have them give an oral presentation? So it's, it's challenging the way that we think about how we have to assess students. And ultimately it's giving space for different forms of assessment and it's requiring multiple attempts at assessment. And Ava and I are not delusional. Well, it depends on who you're asking, but we're not delusional about the, the place that a CFA, a common formative assessment has. We're not mis, misguided in, in acknowledging that that is something that PLCs do need at times to be able to say what is working and what isn't. We are not saying scrap those or toss those, but we are saying that those should not be relied upon as the only form of assessment. Furthermore, assessment is not just a noun, it is a process. And so when we give our kids feedback, which they deserve, a test or a singular assessment should not be the, the only nail in their, it should not be a nail in their coffin, it should be a, a conversation. An assessment should lead kids to reflecting, growing, taking advantage of the feedback you provide, 
give them chance number two, chance number three, chance number 10, until you have given them the opportunity they need and deserve to say, I got this. And so we re- need, we need to rethink the value of an assessment, what it communicates, what a score communicates, and, and how to utilize them to move everybody forward. And this is especially important during an NTI setting because I'm a sucker for quick multiple choice CFA so that I know, okay, we've obtained understanding, we can move deeper or we have a deep understanding of this so we can build on this understanding to something else. But when we think about CFAs or multiple choice summative assessments in NTI, and this has been an outcry since NTI 1.0 of, well, how do I know they're not cheating? assessment when it's good should not be something that a student can cheat at. Assessment should be based in student growth, student creation, and student understanding. So to Rachel's point, we're not saying throw it out. What we are asking is that there is a time and place and that those are being purposely utilized for student growth. Absolutely. So um, I want to move us forward and I recognize that our time is quickly waning. We want you to understand, like we had mentioned earlier, that the R tool, it is, it is a huge shift and it requires lots of time and practice and, you know, reflecting, but we do want you to see ways in which it it works well, it holds hands again um, with the PLC framework so that you can start folding it into the practices that you and your PLC have already begun. Um, even for sake of time, I don't know how much time you feel comfortable spending on this. And I know that we've linked the, the larger document here. Um, I'm going to hand it to you and we can make that choice. Okay. We're, we're going to agree five minutes because I think we're two minutes over the one hour mark and I don't want to get it. yelled at. Um, no. So what Rachel and I have done here is look at each individual piece of the R tool and just think about where it logically fits. Again, this is not us saying that when you are in this step of the PLC framework, you must utilize just this portion. And you're going to notice that there are some steps that have multiple portions because it's a choice. As professionals, it is on you to understand the district's racial equity policy. And it's on you to understand your school's racial equity plan and how these things can be carried out in your classroom. The R tool is your tool to guide that work. So when we're talking about content integration, for example, how we create common formative assessments, content integration should definitely be part of that conversation. Is the assessment representative to diverse populations, diverse viewpoints, um, divergent ways of thinking, or is upholding stereotypes and bias and things that we normatively find? Um, So what you're gonna see in the next three slides is the R tool piece and then the PLC steps that it logically links with. I'm going to have Rachel progress us um, past these three slides to show you what we've actually created. Um, So there's an alignment document and it's what's linked right there. And what this alignment document does is show you for each step of the PLC framework how the R tool can be integrated. So what we've done is take the PLC framework and the directive of that specific step and thought through it with an equity lens in mind. And then what we have offered is the sections we think most adequately align to it. So this is, again, not the only way, but it is one way. So if you are new to this work, if you are looking at the R tool and having a panic attack and scrambling to email Rachel or myself, this is something that makes it manageable and it's something that you can engage with with your colleagues. Rachel and I have demonstrated through this entire presentation what conversation can do for understanding. We've built back and forth on each other continually. That is really what we are hoping to foster. And I think it is hugely important to give yourself some grace in this process, knowing that you don't know everything, but collectively we learn, we know so much more. And so conversation is going to enhance that. But let's go back to your own brain science. If you don't have the schema to pull all of this together right away, then of course it's going to be daunting at first. But as you continue to, to integrate it and fold it into your PLC planning process, it becomes more and more easy, more and more understandable. And it 
it just becomes a second language for you. So we're not asking you to adopt this 100% tomorrow. We are asking you to give yourself time and space to learn it and understand it. But there is still the obligation to be aware that the policy exists at the, at the um, district level and that every school does have a racial equity plan as well. And by fostering these deeper understandings, you're moving your school forward. There's just so many opportunities for growth for, for all stakeholder groups. So knowing that we are way over time, <laughs> um, once again, here's our contact information. There is a post-session Q&A that we are happy to invite you to, and that link is there. I'm gonna leave the screen up for just a few moments. Do understand that we are just an email and a phone call away, and it is our job and our pleasure to guide you, help you be a sounding board, be a thought partner in this process. Um, ask us questions, because the only way that we can know what to anticipate in terms of your needs is to listen to you. So we are absolutely here for you, and, and we love doing this. So thank you so much for your time and attention.